In his talk, Glory of the Blood, inspired by 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Assistant Pastor Warren McNeil unveils some basic truths about what it means to have a relationship with the living God. He says it's not based upon a set of formula of do's and don'ts, but on freedom of relationship with the Lord. So come, listen, and be released into freedom of the glory of the blood. Father, we thank you. We thank you so far for being able to praise and worship you, spend time in your presence. And Lord, we also thank you that we spent time in your presence as we spoke with each other and chatted over tea and coffee. Lord, I do thank you for that. Thank you that you continue always to be in your presence, whether we're aware of it or not. But Lord, you are always present. Lord, now, as we look at your word, I ask, Lord, that you will speak to us. Lord, I offer myself up to you to speak through me to all of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Can you turn with me, please, to an incredibly well-known passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at this and chapter 4. We're going to look at both chapters. So we're going to have a Warren McNeil marathon again through two chapters in the Bible. But obviously we're not going to be able to look at it all completely in-depthly. And to say to you that it's a neat two chapters, I would be really lying to you. It's not neat. It doesn't separate itself very well. So hopefully you can bear with me and follow me in this. 2 Corinthians is one of two letters that we have that was sent by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. I say one of two because there is 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. There is assumed and believed there are another two letters that were originally produced that no longer exist. We do not have them. So there's sort of a gap between one and two. There might be a sort of a letter or two letters in between. But really, this letter, 2 Corinthians, is Paul writing to the church at Corinth what is known as a apologetic discourse. In other words, it's his defense as an apostle. In his letter, this main reason for this letter is that he's defending his uh, role as an apostle. He's defending, putting forward why he can declare himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason he's doing this is because there are what's known as uh, uh, Christian Jews who have come down, why Paul is away from Corinth, uh, Corinth, Corinth, that they've come down and started to impose some of their, how can I put this, impose some of their ideas and what it is to follow Jesus. And they're also opposing Paul. They're saying that Paul is not a true apostle because he wasn't really the uh, um he wasn't around with Jesus when Jesus, pre-Jesus' resurrection. He never actually met Jesus as such, as far as they're concerned, in the flesh. How can he call himself an apostle? His teaching that he's bringing is not uh, quite correct. So there is this. The Corinthian church is mainly made up of Gentiles, i.e. non-Jewish people who have come to know Christ. Corinth the, t- the big city of Corinth is mainly made up of pagan worshippers. When I refer to temples in Corinth, I'm talking about pagan temples, not the Jewish temple. I am talking, not the, I am talking about pagan temples where they would uh, worship many, many gods and they would do it in rituals. There would be uh, temple prostitution. It would not be exactly what you would call holy worship because it's definitely not of the one true God. It is of many gods. It's that sort of city. So the church at Corinth is made up of people that come from that background, that idea of worship. They are clearly early Christians learning their stuff. The Christian Jews have come and actually are saying that the law needs to be taken into account. You need to take in the law of Moses, what we would now see as the Old Testament. You need to take that into account to follow Jesus. Everybody with me so far? We're going to have a bit of a background here. Bear with me on this one and we'll get there. What the issue happens to be is, is that both camps, both the Corinthian church and these Jewish Christians that have arrived, have got really one basic question between them. 
And the basic question is this, how does one participate fully in the power of the Holy Spirit? That's actually their basic question. This, when you look at the whole of this letter, you'll see in mirror image that appears to be their basic question. How do you far fully participate in the power of the Holy Spirit? Now, that might well be your question to yourself every time you look at our church motto, which is now in its newer version for this year, its extended version, but it is a been up there now for two years, slightly version, and now this extended version with the rest of it in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's their basic question. That could be very much our basic question. Some of us saying, well, how do I fully participate in the power of the Holy Spirit? How does this happen? How do I go about this? So we're going to look at this. Now, the Jewish Christians, Paul's opponents, their answer was based upon what is known as an over-realized glory concept. What they believed is that you could not, if you was a follower of Christ and you was in the power of the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't be suffering anymore and you are free from sin. There should be no suffering in your life and you should be free from sin. Paul is saying, well, that's not true. His defense about being a true apostle is the fact that he is suffering. He's suffering for the gospel. And we'll see that in chapter four and a bit later on. For the Corinthian church who come from pagan temple backgrounds, they are used to rituals in trying to get themselves uh, to twist the arm of the gods to work in their lives, yeah? If you read up, you'll find that most rituals, be it whatever they're doing, sacrificing animals, doing whatever else, is to twist the arm of God to do, their gods to do something, either to free them from suffering or to give them a blessing of some nature. So you've got this in the back of their minds when they are coming to follow Christ. So for Paul's opponents, they are saying to the Gentile believers, the, the Corinth church, you need to have the law of Moses in your life. This will guarantee you freedom from sin and freedom from suffering. You need to follow the rituals and the practices of the Jews. Paul is saying... No, there is a distinct difference between Moses's covenant that God made with Moses and now the covenant you have in Jesus Christ. Okay, with that slight backdrop, and I hope you're with me on that one, it took me some time to get it together in my head myself. Let's look and let me read the whole of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 to you. This is Paul speaking. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation? To you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the letter, sorry, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of, wit of that which lasts? Therefore, 
Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull for this, for to this, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with an ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Let's go back to verses one to six, see if we can unpack some of this and see what's, what's being said. I don't know about you, but when I was an early Christian and even now, sometimes I find Paul really hard. Paul can be very, seem to be all over the place sometimes. You're thinking, sorry, Paul, what? But, uh, you know, when you start sitting in it a bit more deeply, you start seeing some stuff. Now, as I said originally, Paul is defending his role as an apostle, as a minister, as a church leader, as a minister. Now, you'll say, okay, so how does this apply to us? Well, this can apply to us because in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, which two years ago was our church motto, you are being built into a spiritual house, living stones, and you are a royal priesthood. So we all at some point have to defend our lives as Christ, Christians, sorry, as Christ, as Christians. So we all are ministers of the gospel in one format or another, all of us. If you know Christ, you're a minister of the gospel. It may take different giftings and different ways of doing it and done in different walks of life. Even when I was a used car salesman, I was still a minister of the gospel. Whatever I did, I was still a minister of the gospel, a royal priesthood. Together, we're a holy nation. It just plays out in different giftings and walks. So my question is, what are we ministers of? Because as I said earlier, it's about Moses' law that they're saying, you've got to take on the law. You've got to follow all of the rules and all the rituals and all the sacrifices if you want to be set free in Christ. You've got to amalgamate the two. So are we ministers of a set of rituals and a set of rules? Or are we ministers of a set of the spirit? Ministers of being set free in Christ and in the spirit. In one to six, sorry, in four to six, we note Paul that writes that it's in God's competence and strength that he ministers, that they function that they live. It is not done in their own strength that they are ministers. It is in God's strength that they do everything. It's not in a set of rituals or a set of set out nice worship plans or preaching plans. It's in, there's nothing wrong with liturgy, by the way. Sorry, I'm not knocking liturgy. I'm just saying. But it's set out in that sort of format. They're saying it's in God's competence, it's in God's strength that they minister. Do we? Do we walk around in this life set out in God's competence or do we try to do things in our own strength, in our own being? You might well have been trained as a doctor, you might well have been trained as a nurse, as a teacher, as a car mechanic, as a motorbike salesman eventually. You know, you might well be taking all that training and it's very easy to take training and a set of this is the way that you do something and forget actually I'm hearing God's strength as well as the backdrop of the training. And it's actually God's strength and power that I need to do all things in. So Paul is saying he wasn't trained as a Christian minister. He was doing it in God's strength. He was doing it under God's authority. He wasn't doing it following a set of rituals. Just wanted to 
pointing that out because it's very easy for us to do things and we think it's down to us to achieve something. It's down to us to achieve that that person comes to know Christ. It's down to us to achieve. As long as I've said the right things to them at the right moment, at the right time, then they'll come to know Christ. Surely that will work. You may think, no, no, don't, don't think like that, Warren. No, don't, don't think like that at all. You may not do. But I think, as Christians, I think we do. And I'll come to why in a moment. I think we pick up something that we shouldn't do. Bear with me a moment. Paul here is saying, no, Corinthian church, you've been set free from rituals. You've been set free. Do not take on the letter. He's not knocking the law of Moses. He's saying it's absolutely something that should exist and be part of. Because it is an attachment to our lives. You know, it is a follow-on into Christ. It points to Christ. All of the Old Testament points, if you look at it, at to the fulfillment that Christ did on the cross. So you don't ignore it. You don't put it to one side and just say, well, that, that no longer exists. We don't have to read that. There are Christians who refuse to read the Old... I'm not saying in this church, by the way. There are Christians who refuse to read the Old Testament because they think it's obsolete. Don't need to look at it. That is not true because that is wrapped up in our entire story of who we are and what our story is about in God and what God's story is about. What Paul is saying is that the letter kills where the spirit gives life. The letter kills following rituals and following set rules kills and this is what the christian jews are trying to say if you want to be set free from suffering and you want to be set free from sin follow these rules and some of these rules weren't in even the torah it was rules that had been made by man over time and them trying to answer the questions well how do we do this how do we love the lord our god with all our heart soul and mind and all the other rules that are in the Old Testament. How do we do this? How does this actually work out in our day to day? So that's how they had them rules that said, you can't do this. When Jesus attacked the Pharisees and said, you know, you say you won't heal somebody on the Sabbath, yet you'll pull out an ox out of the, out of the well. That was because rules said you can't heal on the Sabbath. That was man-made rules. That's not in the Old Testament at all. That's them trying to figure out what is and what isn't work. You with me so far? There was silence. I take it that maybe no. <laughs> so, as I said, Moses' law, Paul is saying in 7 to 11, in verses 7 to 11, he is saying, actually, it's temporary. If you look, it is temporary. He's saying quite clearly, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now. I, Moses' law no longer has glory. It came with glory, but it doesn't have it anymore. How much more surpassing is the glory of Jesus Christ and his covenant? If it surpasses the old covenant, it's got to be more glorious now. Does that make sense? We'll get to that. Thank you for the amen. As I said, the, Moses' law was not to be done away with. But the spirit behind the law, the Moses covenant and law, like the Ten Commandments, the spirit of it, its principles, its, its process, got killed over the centuries by man-made rules and how you follow it. The, the sort of the life got sort of sucked out of it in rituals and rules. You can see that. Jesus proved that when he did the Sermon on the Mount. The blessed are you, or the blessed, the Beatitudes as it's commonly known as. They're actually the spirit behind the law. All Jesus was showing was, love the Lord your God with all your soul, mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Do not amalgamate, Warren, your words. You know, you will have no other idols before me. All of those. If you see them in, 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 uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see the fact actually they look the same, believe it or not, but they are the spirit behind the law. I've preached on this 
some time ago. Um, they are the spirit behind the law. They are the principles behind the law. The very fact that Jesus is on the mountain delivering these mirrors Moses receiving the commandments on the mountain. It's that imagery that Matthew and Luke are trying to show in the New Testament. So Jesus is saying, you sort of missed it. It's not a set of rituals and a set of rules. This is the spirit behind it. Blessed are the meek. You know, it's about humbly being with your neighbor, humbly being with your people around you. That's what he was getting at. So, as I said, unfortunately, the law seems to have got turned into a set of man-made rules. And unfortunately, the people broke that law. They couldn't uphold it. The Jewish people couldn't uphold the covenant with God. They broke it. I know we know this. I know we know this. Bear with me. Don't turn to it. Good. Just broke a piece of the ribbon. In Jeremiah chapter 31, 32, God says, I will not make... I will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That is God declaring the new covenant that he made in Christ Jesus. Because the people could not hold to the old covenant, because it had turned into a set of rules. It wasn't meant to be. God brought it with glory, and we'll look at that in a moment. But it got turned into a set of rules. So Paul is saying that the old ministry, the old covenant, brought death in verse 7 and condemnation, he says, in verse 9. Yet it still comes with glory. It still came originally with glory, where the new covenant in Jesus actually comes with righteousness and with spirit. Can you see that in verse 8? In verse 7, it says that actually the ministry, the Mosaic law, actually came with death brings death and brings condemnation in verse 9. But actually, the spirit, the law, the covenant with Jesus comes with spirit and comes with righteousness. What is righteousness? It's acquittal. Righteousness in Christ means you are declared innocent. So what Paul is trying to say to the Corinthian church is, why, if you've been set free from your rituals and everything else, would you want to take on something that's going to tie you down again? there's actually going to make you feel condemned. You're going to take on rules and rituals that are going to make you feel like you can't live up to, and you are going to feel condemned. When in Christ, you are set free in the spirit, and you have been given righteousness. You have been acquitted. Why take on a set of Old Testament rules? Now, why would the Corinthian church want to take on the Jewish law, because that's clearly what was going on. They were tempted to do so. They wanted, they were taking on these rules. While they were doing that, it comes to their culture. Their culture is old is better. Old is known. Old is a good comfort blanket. New is fresh and untried. They didn't like new. So the Jewish religion, the Jewish tradition was old, tried and tested. If it's old, the older something was, the closer to the gods you were. That was their thinking. So the Jewish religion had been around a lot, lot longer. The Jewish tradition had been around a lot, lot longer. So they thought, well, this is old. So this has got to be us getting closer to God. So therefore, if we're closer to God, we're closer to the all-surpassing power of the Holy Spirit. That's why they were wanting to hang on to these rules and rituals. This is why they were trying to take it on board. They liked the old. It did make me laugh, though. If Jesus is before all things and in all things and everything is in and through him, he's actually older than anything else. Do you ever look at that? But that's their culture. But they didn't get that. They thought Jesus, being a Christian, was a newer religion. Therefore, then they were suspicious of it. Now, this makes me laugh because here in the West, we don't get that. Because we like new. 
the latest gadgets, latest cars, latest iPhone S, 4S, is that the latest thing? I have no idea. iPads, I'll keep going, shall I? Galaxies, stone tablets, oh no, not stone tablets, they're computer tablets now, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah, I need to look back at my, my laptop and sort of chisel some new stuff out in it. Um, but we like new. So we don't quite get this old is better. It's very hard, unless it's a vintage car, and we look at it with a sense of comfort. Well, I do anyway. But, you know, we like new. We much prefer new. But they liked old. But I'll tell you what we do like in this country. We do like rules. We like health and safety rules. Well, you may not like them, but we have them at ad infinitum. Some are good. Some are slight. Anyway. Um, but we do like rules. We like to know where things, we as humans like to know where things neatly fit sometimes. We try and say, oh no, I like to be spontaneous. I like to be, you know, uh, sort of different. But we do like certain amounts of rules. And we bring that mindset in our walk with Christ. We like benchmarks. We like to test ourselves. And this is what was going on. For the Corinthian church, they wanted some benchmark test you know they wanted to know what to do and actually that's what the old testament offered it offered to them well if you do this 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 and this you'll get closer to the participation in the power of the holy spirit and we like that we like the idea of maybe being set of benchmarks set of things we can achieve I am not going to mention the olympics and gold medals and silver medals and bronze medals i'm not doing that Notice that Tom Daly was very, very happy with his bronze last night. Good on him. Did watch it, but I loved every second of it. Right. But we do like set of rules. I'll tell you what we do like, and I learned this. When I've been a Christian now 20 years, I can actually say that. I've been a Christian for 20 years. And I don't know about you, but what do you think about Galatians 5? It's up here. The fruit of God's Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is peace, joy, goodness, kindness, patience, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, and most importantly of all, love. Do you like Galatians 5? It's good, isn't it? That's the fruit of the Spirit. Don't know about you, but in my early walk, and I know I'm not alone in this, and I know many Christians have done this, they almost see this as the thing to measure themselves against on a daily basis. Have I achieved this today? Or did I break my, lose my temper today? Oh dear, lost my temper. Well, that's it. I haven't done patience today. Didn't do patience today. Can't, can't achieve um, anything now. Can't do anything for God. I'm not going to get attached now to the power of the Holy Spirit because actually I lost my temper. Didn't do patience. Did I do love today? No, no, no. I really, really, really did not like my friend. I really lost my temper with them. And I didn't, oh dear, I didn't do love neither. Whoops. Did I do self-control? No, I lost my temper. Didn't do self-control. Hmm. Did I do gentleness? No, didn't do gentleness. Well, I'll cross that one off as well. Okay, fine. Did I do kindness? Clearly not. No, fine. Was I faithful to my friend? No, clearly not, because I lost my temper with them. Did I do peace? No, because we are now not talking, so there's no peace. Um, okay, did I do goodness? No, no, clearly not, because I wasn't good to them, didn't do anything. So did I do joy? No, because I'm miserable as sin. <laughs> you laugh. But do you hear me? How it becomes insipid, setting a, following a set of rules? Galatians 5 were not a set of rules. They are fruits of the Spirit. They are fruits of the Spirit. An inside voice will tell you, a condemnation voice will say, well, if you didn't achieve this, God can't use you today. You're out of sorts. You can't be used today. You can't participate in Acts 1.8. You can't be used today. That was the Christian Jewish way of thinking that they were trying to bring into the Corinthian church, I would humbly suggest. 
but it's fruits of the Spirit. These are examples of how these, I'm just using these as an example. These are examples of how a person will be as they turn to the Lord, as they spend time in Christ. Not in rituals and rules, but in relationship with Jesus. This is fruit. Fruit. If you allow Christ to renew you day by day, this is fruit. Not something to look back up, back at the evening, look back at the day and go, did I do, no, because believe you me, I don't know about you lot, if I looked at those a set of rules on a daily basis, well, I need to take that down. Whoever made that, I have no idea, it's lovely, but I'd need to take that down because I would not need reminding every day. And I'm sure I'm not alone. Oh, I am alone. No. Yeah, let's get that clarified. It's fruit, tasty and sweet, desirable. It grows when we allow the gardener to tend us. Gardener being God. All we're asked to do is find where the water is. Allow our roots to discover. If you was a tree producing this fruit, all you would do is search for the water. You just allow your roots to go where the water is. That's all you do as a tree. And then the gardener does the rest. They do the pruning and the gardening and see the fruit grow and they produce the fruit. And do you know what the fruit also doesn't do? It produces fruit that people are drawn to. People want to know about. They want to pick it up and taste it. If you have the fruit of the spirit, all it is are people drawn to your fruit. It's not something for you to manifest, to make up. You let Christ work in your life, this fruit will be produced. You do no more than allow Christ to work in it. So these are not a set of rules. These are fruits of the Spirit working in your life. With me so far? So it's not a set of rituals that you're meant to attend to. You are not meant to go, yes, yes, oh, I did it today. I achieved patience. I didn't lose my temper with my wife or my husband or my boyfriend or my girlfriend or with my work colleagues or with my children or with any of my church family. I achieved total patience today. Praise the Lord. I can now be used by the Lord today. Oh, no, I can't. The day's ended. They're not a set of rules. So what was Moses saying, uh, sorry, what was Paul saying that makes people think like this? What is it that he was saying that don't follow rituals, don't follow rules, what is going on? It's a veil, he's saying. In verses 12 to 18, he's saying it is a veil. What is happening is a veil is covering the faces of those who follow a set of Moses' law. If you follow a set of rules, a veil covers your face. You do not see Christ at work and in freedom in your life and in the lives around you. Let's just look at what he was talking about with Moses. Can we? Can you turn with me to ex, keep your finger in two Corinthians? Can you turn to Exodus chapter thirty-four, uh, verses uh, twenty-nine to thirty-five? When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the Testament in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him and he gave all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. So Paul, in 2 Corinthians, is trying to use, or is using, the metaphor of a veil. A veil that is covering the hearts of those that want to follow the rules, want to follow Mosaic law. And he's saying, there is a problem with this. A 
Verse 15 of 2 Corinthians, he states, even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. So whenever the Mosaic law is read, a veil seems to come over the hearts of the Jewish believers. They don't seem to see Christ in scripture because the glory of that Old Testament is now past. A new glory in the covenant of Christ has come instead. So whenever the Old Testament is read, they do not see Jesus in that. They see a set of rituals and a set of rules. Now, I want to say this to you. Paul was writing before the New Testament was put together. The New Testament, as we have it now in the Bible, is not put together. It wasn't then, it was just letters, just doing the rounds. Gospel, doing the rounds. It's now put together. I would say humbly that we as Christians sometimes read the New Testament and a veil comes over our eyes and we see it as a set of rules. Like Galatians 5 being one. Like the Beatitudes. Even the Beatitudes, some see as a set of rules. Oh, I'm not blessed today. I wasn't particularly meek. Or I'm not blessed today because I didn't go and help the poor. Or I'm not blessed today because I wasn't a peacemaker. We read the New Testament sometimes as a set of rules. So when we see this, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you've got the same question as the Corinthian church. How do I participate more fully in the power of the Holy Spirit? You want somebody to say to you, what's the ritual? How do I go about this today? Have I spent long enough with my God in preparation for today? Have I spent the set 15 minutes? Have I read my Old Testament, New Testament, one option of Proverbs and the whole of one Psalm for the day? before God can use me. See, you laugh, but you get it, because I bet it's rested on your mind sometimes that you've gone to work or whatever else, and suddenly went, oh, I didn't read my Bible this morning. Oh, let me repent now. Lord, let me repent. I now have become ineffective for the day because I didn't do my daily devotions first thing this morning. By the way, there's nothing wrong with daily devotions first thing in the morning. I do them. I'm not saying, oh, I'm not holier than thou, but that's the best time for me to do them. Some other people, it's best time to do them is in the evening. Some people, 12 o'clock at night. That's absolutely fine. And we need to read the word of the Lord, and we need to meditate on it, and we need to do all of that because we understand more and more about God and who we are in him. And he, allow, he uses his word to change us and to transform us i'm not taking away reading or doing any of that thing that still needs to be done on a daily basis but not done as a set of rules and rituals to actually be done because you want to so moses notice that moses when he went into the tent his face was radiant because he had spent time with god like the fruits of the spirit the fruits come out as we spend time with God. Not as a ritual, but as a relationship. Because it's new and it's glorious. And Moses would have covered his face. Have you noticed, by the way, that Moses actually initially did not notice the fact that his face was radiant? It wasn't until the reaction of the Israelites that he realized that something was up. You won't know that you are radiant in the fruits of the Spirit or in the fruit of Christ. It will be the reaction of the people around you. It's not like a warm, gooey feeling. Being in Christ and allowing the fruit of the Spirit to work in your life, people will see that in you. You won't necessarily always see it in yourself. That's probably a good thing because you become conceited then. I talk from experience. Moses didn't know that, but his radiance obviously was fading, according to Paul. Each time he spent further and further away from God. Every time he returned back to God and went into the tent of meeting, the radiance shone again. It came radiant. 
And what he's saying is that Moses would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites couldn't see the fading glory. And Paul is saying the Old Testament, the old rituals, they have fading. They were always fading from the time that they came into being because they were all pointing to the everlasting glory of Jesus Christ. It's not about rules and rituals. And what Paul is saying is that when the really good laws of God are read, a veil is put deliberately over people's faces because they don't see it. They don't see what God is trying to do and it's setting them free. False condemnation comes across. Veiled eyes make us not see what actually is really there. I was going to go into the old chapter four, but I'm going to be absolutely honest and say we've run out of time. Almost, got another 10 minutes to go and there's more I've got to say on this. Chapter four. I will say this to you. It talks about, if you can look at verse seven, just very quickly with me. It reads, wells for itself. The whole of chapter four is beautiful. But Paul is saying, because of suffering, because of this glory that is present in Jesus Christ, this is not of our own doing. In verse seven, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. I don't know about you, I don't like being compared to an earthen jar of clay. But that's what Paul is doing. He's saying, you're a jar of clay. Don't look particularly attractive. You're not made inlaid with gold or silver or platinum. You're an earthen jar. You're down to earth. You can be filled and used. And the reason you're that is because actually you have no glory of your own. It's everything is done through Christ. Everything is done by God. It's not born out of a set of rituals, not born out of a set of rules. The glory that God brings through you is not manifested by you following a set of rules. Or a set of rituals. I don't know about you. As a Christian, I don't know if you walk around on a daily basis, I said earlier on, thinking, oh, I've not done this today. I've not followed my set pattern for the day in following God. Therefore, then I cannot be used. I said, I lost it today. I did something wrong today. I can't be used. The power of the Holy Spirit can't work in me now. Forget it for the day. I can't be a witness in the power of the Holy Spirit because I made a mistake. That's not true. Right at the beginning, the whole of this new covenant, remember when I said it brings acquittal, it brings righteousness, it brings the declaration that you are innocent. You are innocent the minute you wake up in the morning in Christ and you're innocent before God all through the day because it's not about you. It's not about a set of rules. That is wrong thinking. You can't be perfect. You're an ordinary earthen jar. Easily cracked. Somebody once said to me, uh, somebody said this week, it's not about, following Christ is not about stopping up the gaps. Which is what the Corinthian church were trying to find. They were trying to find things that would stop up what they thought were gaps in their lives to make up for what they were missing. So I can power, fulfill my life in the power of the Holy Spirit, I need some set of benchmark rules. Lord, I need to get rid of my sin before I can do this. I was reading some books today, out of the blue, personal reading, and it happened to be talking about this. I couldn't believe it. I felt like God was going, yes. We say you must flee from sin or throw everything off that hinders. And that is absolutely true. But it's not about us throwing off the sin. Christ does it for us as we spend time with him, in relationship with him. Not waking up with my do not do list. Walking with Christ is not a set of do's and don'ts. 
There is only one command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind, your neighbour as yourself. That was the golden command. Do the love of your Lord your God with your heart, soul and mind, everything else will follow naturally. In other words, spend relationship time with him and everything else will come out naturally. It's not about ticking off, have I done that sin today? No, I didn't. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Sin management was one term. Must make sure I don't sin today. Don't sin today. Fine. If you don't want to sin, go and sit in a locked box all day. Guaranteed you still won't not sin because you've got your mind. Believe you me, that does more sinning than probably your body does. You're all sniggering. Yeah, we know what that's like, Warren. It's not about sin management. You were declared innocent the minute you woke up and the minute you gave your life to Christ. It's not about sin management. It's about spending time with our Lord and allowing the fruit of spending time with him to generate the radiance and the fruits of the spirit that is needed. It's not about following a set of rules. Some people say, yeah, but Lord, but we're suffering. I'm suffering. I must be doing something wrong. That's another thing. I must be doing something wrong because I'm suffering at this time. I don't see suffering and glory, unfortunately, as a Christian, go hand in hand. There is some suffering we suffer because of wrong decisions that we have made. And we have to suffer the consequences of those wrong decisions. But it doesn't stop us, once we've asked for forgiveness, to be declared innocent from them. Some suffering comes about because we are doing the very thing that Christ wants us to do. The cleansing has been done by Jesus. You do not participate in this through a set of rules and rituals. You, set, you participate in the power of the Holy Spirit because of your relationship with him. And it's a voluntary relationship. You can be as close or as near to Christ as you want to be. He's always there, ready and present. No matter how it feels, you can be as close or as distant from him as you wish. Take your friendships, your own friendships out of Christ. We were singing that song, what if, what if um, I am a friend of God, he calls me friend. And that is true. You can be a friend of God and he calls you friend. But if you look at your own set of friendships and relationships, depending upon how often you talk on the telephone or meet up, depends on how well you know each other, doesn't it? That's the only ritual, if you want to call it, that you have with Christ, is actually spending time with him. And you do that on a daily basis. And you can do that in quiet time and you can do that in the busyness of life. And then you can participate in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not, it is not about following rituals and rules. And if you think, no, I don't do that, Warren, I don't actually follow rituals and rules. No, I really don't. There is some cultural thinking that does because there is freedom where God is at. And if you judge others by their standards and you look at them and think, oh, well, they're not doing what I would do, or what, it, you know, you judge people, then you're setting up a set of rules and standards already. I know we laughed at Mark when Mark talked about shaving off his head and having to dress smart and get shaved and all that. And I went, praise the Lord, because he wasn't going to look, as he said, well, I won't use it, he wasn't going to look scruffy. Yeah? But actually, if, Paul, if Mark wishes to follow Christ as he wishes to follow in that dress code, in that way of looking, that's entirely up to him. But the problem is the rules and regulations of his company is going to be, no, you've got to look clean shaven and clean head. That's fine as well. And that's also just as good. But it's not rules and regulations that make you participate in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is freedom in Christ and understanding that you are actually free. It's not sin management. Don't walk around, walk around with veiled eyes that say there is nothing possible for me today because I made it wrong. I did something wrong. Because I don't see a God who works like that in the Bible. If that was the case, you wouldn't have Moses because he really got it wrong. He murdered someone, yet he still got called. 
Look at all the characters in the Bible. They really, really made mistakes. Gideon, total lack of faith, kept asking God, can I just make sure it is you talking to me? But God still used him. False penance for about three days because you made a mistake on Monday and you don't feel fully recovered to about Thursday is wrong thinking. You are acquitted the minute you ask for forgiveness. You're declared innocent before the sight of God because of what Jesus did on the cross. You are declared acquitted because of what Jesus did on the cross. All you have to do is turn to the Lord, not follow a set of rules. And as you read the Old and the New Testament, don't read them with a veil. Because it is grace. Jesus never asked us to do any ritual cleansing. He said, you're already clean because of what I've done on the cross. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, what I pray for, if veils are removed from our eyes, all of us in the name of Jesus. All of us in the name of Jesus. Where we have veils, Lord, where we think, A, we've either got it right and we haven't, remove those veils. Lord, where we think we've got it wrong and we haven't, remove those uh, veils, Lord. What I ask for is our veils are removed, that we recognise, Lord, that we are acquitted in you. We are declared innocent before the sight of the almighty God, not because of what we do and not because of our sin management, but Lord, because of what you did on that cross for us. Lord, I ask afresh for this week that all of us, where we might wake up with that condemning voice because we didn't tick off the right number of boxes for today. Lord, that you remove that in the name of Jesus. You remove that veil. We can walk in the freedom of you. Because it says, where is the spirit? There is freedom. Remove that for us, Father, I pray. All of us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for patiently listening to that. But I ask, I pray that your veils will be removed. If you've got veils, get them removed. Don't let condemnation sit on you. It's not about a set of rituals and rules. It's all about our God and what he did for us. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.